Oh, Tep, and welcome to Matters of, Doc Matters of Diversity with Dr. B. Today, I'm a little tongue-tied because of the guest I have today. But today, we're honoring World Health Day 2021. And the WHO is saying that it's building a fairer, healthier world. So on World Health Day, 7th of April, we will be inviting you to join a campaign, this is coming from the WHO, to build a fairer, healthier world. We'll be posting more details um, on their website, so go there and find some things that they are sharing with you about today. From their perspective, our world is an unequal one. As COVID-19 has highlighted, some people are able to live healthier lives and have better access to health services than others, entirely due to the conditions in which they are born, where they grow up, where they live, where they work, and their age. All over the world, some groups struggle to make ends meet with a little daily income, have poorer housing conditions and education, fewer employment opportunities, experience greater gender inequality, and have little or no access to safe environments, clean water and air, food security and health services. This leads to unnecessary suffering, avoidable illness and premature death. And it harms our societies and our economies. This is not only unfair, it is preventable. And we're gonna talk about a little bit of that today so who goes on to say that that's why they are calling for our leaders to ensure that everyone has living and working conditions that are conducive to good health. At the same time, we urge leaders to monitor health inequities and to ensure that all people are able to access quality health services when and where they need them. COVID-19 has hit all countries hard but its impact has been harshest on those communities where anybody could be vulnerable, who are more exposed to the disease, less likely to have access to quality health care services, and more likely to experience adverse consequences as a result of measures implemented to contain the pandemic. So the WHO, like myself, we're committed to ensuring that everyone everywhere can realize the right to good health. And to help me talk a little bit about this today, I have a very special guest who's coming to kind of hang out with me for the hour and just bring his 20 years of experience in primary health care services to the table. And that's Dr. Wilma Schillingford, Dr. Andy Schillingford, who is a general practitioner and family physician. He is currently employed at the Cayman Islands Health Services Authority in Grand Cayman, originally from the country of Dominica, and that is not the Dominican Republic, but Dominica, we'll talk a little bit about that. He qualified in medicine in 1996 at the UWI in Mona, Jamaica, trained in GP medicine in Essex in the UK, where he practiced before moving to the Cayman Islands in 2006. He's a member of the Royal College of Physicians in the UK. He has a strong interest in healthcare education and frequently delivers health-related discussions with community organizations independently as the chair of the Cayman Islands Cancer Society Education Committee and is founder and past presenter of a popular radio show in Cayman. So he's trying to be my um, contemporary right now. Doctor's Orders. And it was on Praise 87.9 FM. He is the immediate past president of the Caribbean College of Family Physicians and continues to serve on the board of this organization. He also has interest in business management. And get this, you all, so he's not only a doctor, but he holds a graduate certificate in business administration from Robert Gordon University in Scotland. This man has been traveling and an MBA from Leicester or Leicester University in the UK. In addition, he has a strong interest in computer and internet technology. I, I, I firsthand know that for sure. 
and is currently a Team PHP programmer for the popular online open source content management software project. So how he's a doctor and what he gets done in his day-to-day -day job, I don't know because he got all these other things going on. Additional hobbies include badminton, chess, and dominoes. He likes alternative rock music. He's a rational thinker. And his favorite personal quote is, question everything. And so with that, I'm gonna bring on Dr. Andy Schillingford and I'm gonna ask him what he's questioning right now. What you questioning, Andy? Dr. Schillingford. Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice Welcome. To you. How are you doing, sir? Everything going out. <laughs> it's doing okay? We're doing very good, very good. Very so good. you have quite the impressive bio. You've been all over I'm the world. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Um, some people stop at the doctor and, 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 and are happy. You have surpassed that on many, many levels. And so that shows you that you can have more than one interest. More of course. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm interested in learning. Your journey and how you got to be where you are today. All right, so um, uh, thank you for the introduction. Just one, just one, uh, this is probably uh -oh. nitpicking, but just one correction. Uh, What's that? The, the the town in the UK, the city I where I say that. <laughs> it's called Leicester. Uh, it, it's, oh, it's spelled with all these word letters. So what what am I, I know. what is the person supposed to do? Impossible to pronounce, but I just thought I'd let you know Leicester is what they call it. It's not so they could just spell it L E S T E R. That's what you're telling me. That's exactly what it should be, in my opinion. But uh, <laughs> I wasn't. On that. <laughs> Wasn't on that committee, so I can't. I can't uh, there you go. There you go. Uh, but yeah. So, what was the question that you were asking? What, what my journey so you, far? You, um, your career? mantra. Your mantra is question everything. So that was one thing I want to get to. But can you kind of tell me a little bit about your journey? How did you get to be Dr. Andy Schillingford hanging out in Cayman Island? Right. I I, I grew up in a small country, as you say, Dominica. And, and thank you for correcting. Uh, it's not the Dominican Republic, they speak Spanish, we speak French Creole. Uh, so bonjour to all our Dominican people who might be listening. Um, it's a small country, just about 40 miles long, small area, very mountainous, uh, population is very small, 70,000 people right now. I believe it might have been a bit less when I was growing up. And uh, my, my parents were very much into academia at least encouraging academia. <laughs> my, my mother was principal of the local primary school. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we grew up as a family who was very much into learning. And uh, as a result, I think uh, of our parents, you know, guidance and training. I think we did very well at, at schools. My, uh, by we, I mean my sisters, I got three of them. Uh, so when it came to deciding what you do with your life in a small country, in a small economy, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but there, at least back then, very limited options in terms of what you're going to choose to do. Uh, if, you, if you're a smart child, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be an engineer. That's it. End of story. So story. as far as I know, from, from the moment you know, growing up as a youngster, you know, people start saying, okay, this boy's got a little bit of sense. Um, <laughs> You're going to be a doctor. I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't so what was your choice starting off? No. I, I keep. I always tell people, you know, I don't exactly recall um, the moment when I decided, okay, I'm going to be a doctor. It just sort of flowed directly into that because, you know, I think, you know, at that time, there's not much. Um, we're not exposed to much in terms of options back then. Yeah. But no regrets. You know, it's a it's a good career. Um, uh, after I finished high school and then uh, we used the British system, so you went to sixth form, uh, what we call sixth form college and after high school, you two years and you do advanced um, courses. And then I got a scholarship to go to University of the West Indies to study medicine. Okay. And that was in 1991. I left at 18, went to Jamaica all by myself, still remember that airplane ride, very good. Um, a very good feeling to be, you know, independent at 18, moving to a, a new uh, country. Uh, it was a very, very interesting five years of medical school. Mm -hmm. uh, followed that by, well, 
year and a half of internship, which I did in Jamaica as well, at the University Hospital of the West Indies. And um, after that, went back to Dominica, when you have a scholarship from a small country, I don't know how it, how it goes in, in the US, but yeah. you know, they require that you, you pay back your-, your Give some time back. So, so you, you go back to give some service back to the people who, who helped you to get where you were, which is- How long you know, did you have to do that for? That was uh, officially, uh, gosh, I, I don't remember. I spent three years there. I think I got excused for one year. Okay, so you might have to do four years, you're saying? Yeah, 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 I think. Um, I don't remember the exact detail, but I spent three years there. And then I did ask permission to leave and go back to study, well, to leave early. And okay. uh, that was fine. So my intention at the time was to go to study uh, general medicine, what we call internal medicine. Right. Which I did, went to the UK, uh, uh, got into the internal medicine program. But um, sometime about three years after I started that program, the, the, the British system at the time was very complicated. To, get, uh, to, to become a doctor back then, very complex, a very long um, involved. You had to do um, at least two years, is what they call a house officer, mm -hmm. followed by uh, between two to four years, is what they call a senior house officer, during which time you would have to do the entry exams into your specialty if you wanted to do a specialty. And then after you got into your specialty, then you would do five years as what they call a registrar and during that time as well it was customary that during that five years you would take some time off and do uh, some research some academic research as part right. of your study so the whole program took um what was that something like 10 10 years 10 so by the time years. you're 75 and 80 years old you can be a doctor at that point I mean, right you're just about to finish <laughs> <laughs> yeah so that, that was the track that I was on. Uh, but uh, I discovered right quickly that I didn't like hospital medicine. I mean, the, the idea of somebody calling me in the middle of the night was extremely annoying. So I, I, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere no, around that. Calling. Yeah, was that? I said, no, you're calling. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so in about 2004, in the UK, um, the, the primary care system in the UK is very well developed. Uh, the, the, the doctors who staff the primary care system are called general practitioners. Uh, in America, you call it family physicians. Right. Um, so at the time uh, when I started uh, internal medicine, a general practitioner in the UK was responsible 24 seven for the healthcare of his patients. Hmm. So you had a defined area where you would look after your patients and uh, you were on call every day, 24 hours a day, it was your responsibility to look after your patient. This wasn't long ago. This was like 2000, 2002, 2000, no, 2004. Mm -hmm. um, but then, um, of course, the population growth and you know, increasingly modern population has increasingly greater demands on someone's time. So uh, there was renegotiation for uh, the GP contract from the government. And there was mm -hmm. a new GP contract, which was quite attractive. Mm -hmm. um, they removed the 24 hour requirements, increased the salaries and made general practice very much more attractive to most people. And to be right. honest, when I left Dominica, my intention was either uh, internal medicine or family medicine. That was my choice back then. I remember discussing that actually with- So uh, by that my, point in time, you were ready to be a doctor, even though yeah. everybody pushed you in that direction, you were, you, you were committed at that point. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just, just, just interestingly enough, my boss at the time um, in Dominico is currently the head of the, 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 the American branch of the World Health Organization, that Dr. Carissa Etienne. She was the, the, the head um, GP in Dominica when I left and we discussed okay. what you know, should do with your life. She's now, so she's now officially the head of primary care for this region of the world, the, the America's part of the World Health Organization, what we call yeah. PAHO. Pan American Health Organization. Okay. So okay. She's now the director of that. And she was my boss back then. So um, at that time, just to cut the long story short, I decided instead of doing medicine to switch to general practice. And 
I did that and then that's it. I've been a GP slash family physician ever since. So, uh, so the question I have for you, and we've had this conversation before. So there's this disconnect when it comes to um, practicing medicine in the United States versus yeah. other places in the world. And bodies are the same. Medicine is basically the same. I don't think people are doing different things in different places. What is it about getting, you know, individuals who are studying outside of the United States to be able to study within the, or, or practice within the United States when they didn't take courses within the, in that system? Can you talk a little bit about, about that? Well, I, I would say in, in fairness, I don't think it's completely unique to, to the United States. Okay. I think every country will have uh, their own requirements as to uh, how you are allowed to practice. Um, the reason is because I suppose you don't practice on your own. You have to be part of a health system and uh, the, the health system needs to be sure that you are capable of practicing within the boundaries of that health system. Uh, to illustrate that, when I, uh, about four years ago, you, we left Cayman Islands and went back to the UK for just about a year. And I, I went there to practice and I had to do exams again. <laughs> Even though I qualified in the UK, the fact that I had been out of the National Health Service for more than two years, I had to have a supervisor, I had to do exams, a whole bunch of exams. I had to be monitored for six months. Uh, somebody had to watch everything I did for six months mm -hmm. before I was allowed to practice independently again. So it is reasonable, I suppose, that the US wouldn't allow anyone to enter into their health system without having specific US experience. Um, but you so is get that, into that's the same. Is it, are, they, are you able to come and still practice under someone or are there a lot of other hoops that you have to get to in the United States? Not, not in the U.S., no. Uh, if you want to practice in the U.S. Uh, from outside, if you qualified uh, and a license outside of the U.S. health system, you have to go back to square one, essentially. You have to, 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 to qualify as a doctor in the U.S., you have to do um, yeah, four years med school, followed by two years internship and then residency to, to specialize in a particular area. To get into the internship part of things, you have to do exams. Um, I, I'm not familiar with what they call them back then, but it, 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 it used to be US medical licensing exam, US MLEs. I think they had three parts the last time I did them. Uh -huh. um, so that's what you had to do. Uh, but if now, right now, I know people who, uh, used to be lecturers when I was in medical school, senior, senior doctors right. uh, who decided to move to the US for whatever reason, you have to go back and do those US exams again, you know, and, and you have to do internship again, and you have to go back and do the, the, the residency again uh, from scratch, even if you've been a senior specialist consultant for, for decades. So that, that, that is one barrier to, to moving to the US. Okay. That's, that seems um, pretty taxing on an individual. So is, do you think that it has cultural ramifications or is that just um, good medicine? Um, I don't know if there would be, uh, what do you mean by cultural ramifications though? Do you think- Well, it seems like, you know, I they'll accept you to come into the country, but they, they give you these parameters, right? So it sounds like, are they not accepting a, a degree from Jamaica? Or are they, or, so that's what I mean by the cultural aspect of it. Or, you know, or are they saying that there are things that are in place, like there's different um, criteria or guidelines or, or benchmarks that you have to reach within the US system that they don't feel that you can get at other universities outside of the US system? That makes Again, sense. I, 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 I get the impression, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert in. Um, you know, medical education or U.S. healthcare politics, but mm -hmm. I get the impression that it is more um, ensuring that a person has exposure to the the, the, the required skills as a physician. Okay. So if you go to medical school, they don't just teach you medicine. You have to be part of a system of healthcare. Um, okay. Every country will have different standards, different guidelines. Um, you know, UK, you follow the, the NICE guidelines, what we call the NICE, uh, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, it used to be. 
the U.S. will have different standards. It would be, you know, um, you know American Academy of Family Physicians or, or different guidelines. And I think the requirements to enter practice into a country is more based on ensuring that a person has exposure to those standards. Having said that, I don't think every country requires you to start from the beginning. Okay. So I think the U.S. is probably a bit more strict than other countries. Okay. Uh, the U.S. does allow people who are trained, doctors who are trained in Canada, to practice in the U.S. See, that's, what I'm, so that's what I'm saying. So there sounds like there's, there's some people who can and some people who can't, you know? But, but they, uh, they ensure that the training is, a, is similar enough uh, okay. to, to the U.S. system. So I think you, the training in Canada is essentially the same as training in the U.S. The, the, the structure so that of the makes the question, then yeah. what is different about the training in Jamaica? So I, I think the, the basic medicine, I suspect, is probably going to be the same. I mean, you, you learn the, 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 how, how to, you know, how to have a consultation, how to ask the right questions, you know, how to diagnose, what tests to order. Um, I would imagine if you're a doctor, you would probably want, you probably know how to do most of the things that an American physician would know how to do. Right. But again, I think, I'm assuming here, uh, I don't know why the U.S. requirements are so strict. Well, it just seems interesting to me. And I'm just, just I'm, I'm sitting here as a lay person, right? Because I'm not a medical doctor. I and understand. I'm, you can, I'm listening to you speak and, and, and the intelligence that's coming from this conversation just tells me that you have the skills, you have the understanding of what a doctor is. You know about the U.S. system, but you can't, you, the, but there are things that are happening that don't allow people who have your circumstances to come and be a part of that. It doesn't feel very welcoming, I guess. It's really what I'm, what I'm get, where I'm getting at with that. But we could, step, we could steer away from that. And It's not welcoming. I think that's the whole point. Say that again? I think that's probably the whole point, to make sure it's not welcoming. Yeah. Make sure that you train all over again. Yeah, it seems pretty daunting for somebody to do another eight years or so so that they can practice in the U.S. That, 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 that's, that's mind-boggling to me. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with that, but I imagine uh, that there are probably reasons for that, but I'm not really familiar with those reasons. So. Yeah, yeah. So let's move away from that. So um, the, the who is, is saying that today is, um, is World Health Day. Health Day. Say it again. Yeah, I was just uh, agreeing with you. World Health Day. Eh? World Health Day. And so um, what does that mean to you? What do you think about that in terms of your role as a, as a doc, as an MD? So um, there are lots of different um, health days throughout the, the calendar. Mm -hmm. You know, we, 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 um, we have days for most of the different conditions, you know, cancer and heart disease and heart attacks and strokes. So there will be different days throughout the, throughout the year, throughout the calendar year, where we sort of um, recognize the importance of um, uh, good health, but we tend to focus on certain areas, specific areas throughout those other days. But this is one day throughout the year where we all um, just generally celebrate good health. Um, it's not something though that it is, at least in the Caribbean, that is uh, very, you know, strictly celebrated. We, we don't generally have, you know, we don't get the day off. We don't have, you know, fancy t-shirts or anything like that. <laughs> It's just, you know, it's just a, a, a day where everyone agrees that this is the day where we recognize healthcare general. Okay. And they tend to have different um, themes uh, every year, um, you know, focusing on different aspects. I think this year we're looking more at uh, healthcare access and equality. Um, and the reason why we're doing that this year is because of, again, COVID-19. Uh, COVID mm -hmm. has sort of exposed inequalities in healthcare that probably would have been hidden, um, at least hidden from public view. <laughs> I'm sure everyone knows that there are inequalities in healthcare. Right. But I think we've been exposed to some inequalities now that we, we can't keep hidden now. So I think this year, World Health Day, World Health Day is um, um, encouraging nations to look at inequalities in Inequality. healthcare. Yeah. yeah. So the Cayman Islands have been 
kind of impacted by the COVID, but you guys really took control of it really early on. You, you tackled it really early on in terms of keeping the people on the island safe. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about what that was and what that was like and where you all are now because of the, the kind of uh, infrastructure you put into place um, right around the time that the pandemic was on its rise? Right, so um, the, the, the COVID struck early last year. Uh, it came to Cayman rather quickly, somewhere in, I don't remember when our first case was, but somewhere near February or March. Okay. Um, uh, as you say, yeah, we, I think all, as a country, Cayman handled it very well. Um, but as far as, from my point of view, there are lots of different points of view, as you know. From my point of view and the point of view of, I think, most healthcare professionals, we did the right thing. We locked the country down immediately. Yeah. Uh, uh, the Caribbean tends to be a very um, strong tourist um, destination. Uh, there hasn't been a cruise ship landing in Cayman since last year, February. Uh, air tourism, no, no, no arrivals from overseas. Um, there was an immediate curfew. Uh, only healthcare professionals... Uh, or essential workers were allowed on the streets. Police, you know, were patrolling the streets. So it was an, an intense lockdown immediately um, while the public health department ramped up their coverage and their monitoring. And right. they managed to, you know, track down, do contact tracing for all of the initial cases and managed to really limit COVID-19 in the Cayman Islands. So we had no, com by somewhere around June, we had stopped all community spread of COVID-19. There was essentially no COVID left in, Ca in Cayman. Right. And because the borders were closed and very well monitored, no air arrivals, no cruise ship arrivals, we were then able to open up the country. So since last summer, we've all been you know, mask-free and walking about and going to the beach and going to restaurants and seeing each other and doing normal things. The only difference right now for us is that there are no no tourists on the street, yeah? but life essentially has been nice. almost normal since, since last summer. And so you all have been participating in taking vaccinations? Yep, we, we started and the vaccination so program early this year, as soon as it was available. Uh -huh. um, the, the, Caribbean, uh, the Caribbean countries, which we, we are officially part of the Caribbean, mm -hmm. uh, essentially are very small economies and um, uh, not able to uh, mock up um, billions of doses of vaccine like the U.S. has done. Uh, so there is a facility via the World Health Organization and, uh, whereby each Caribbean country is allocated certain doses where they, they can uh, 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 give those to their, their citizens or residents. Uh, but the Cayman Islands being a British territory, we are fortunate to be part of the British um, supply of um, vaccine. So we, we were able to get early doses, early um, doses of vaccine. Um, and we started very quickly, very early. So right now we've given out to the, the country has about 60,000 people. We've given out about 52,000 doses of vaccine already. Wow. A significant proportion of the country is already vaccinated. So um, my entire household, exception of my 11 year old um, has been vaccinated already. Most of my healthcare uh, colleagues uh, fully vaccinated. Um, I think I had my second dose by the end of February. Um, wow. So we're, we're doing very well. Uh, which, which doses did you take? Which we, we had the Pfizer one. You had the Pfizer. Uh, yeah, yeah. We, we, that, that's what we, we've been using in, in the country ever since. Okay. So what kind of advice would you give to those? Because, I mean, I was really excited to hear you just say that you're, walk, you're walking around without masks on. Um, I might have to come visit and get stuck in Cayman Island for, for, the, for, the, for the time being. So, quarantine. <laughs> I'll deal with the quarantine. But I've been vaccinated as well. So I've been, double, I've been doubly vaccinated as well. So 10 day quarantine, even if you're back quarantine. Very strict here. Very, very right. strict. I, can you make it so that I can work remotely? As long as that happens, I think I'll be good to go. Um, there's a program for, for, for uh, um, uh, wealthy people who want to work remotely in the Cayman Islands. Well, if guess your what? Salary is a minimum of $150,000, I believe. Um, 
or if you're a family, I believe it's two hundred thousand. Oh, you have to pay that up front. No, no, you have to have a, a minimum salary so that we know when you come in, you're not going to be a, a burden on the on the on the. On oh, oh okay. Well, can you kind of put the paperwork together? And well, you have to show me your bank account details first, and then <laughs> I have to show you the bank account. <laughs> I'll put you in touch with somebody. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we would love to be at a point where we in the United States are without masks. Um, and I guess at some point it will come. What, what, what kind of advice would you give to those who, you know, who are still standing in some type of denial that this thing is happening and that this thing is going on and don't want to wear masks? Um, what, 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 as a, as a sitting doctor, what would you share is, are things that might help people to get to the other side of the doubt or the skepticism? That, that's an extremely difficult question. Okay. I'm sure you know that as a I only asked you that question because I know how intelligent you are and how you will be able to kind of work your way through it. But that's, that's the thing, you know, <laughs> that when people have this kind of ideological positions. Yeah. It's extremely difficult to move people in a direction, especially okay. like in your situation where there's politics involved. Uh, people, I, I think the people who have these positions, you know, the, the COVID deniers and the vaccine deniers and the, the no maskers and the, I'm, I'm not so sure that they are thinking rationally most of the time. And it becomes really difficult to convince people um, when they have that sort of mindset. I don't think just giving people information, because information is available. Yeah. A person wants to know if they should wear a mask or not, whether it's the right thing or the logical thing or the healthy thing to do. The information is available. You, you can find that easily. You just ask a few questions, a simple Google search. It's, it becomes obvious. Okay. So I don't think those people want to know. I think people fix on certain positions uh, because of their, their politics or their, their, their upbringing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it is extremely difficult. As you know from my, the, the bio that I should thank you for, for reading so well. Um, uh, I, I'm very interested in how people think. Uh, and, you know, it's difficult. You have conversations with people about these things and it's difficult to get them to even see the logic and reasoning of people who don't believe. I mean, I had a conversation just last week with an intelligent healthcare worker, you know, and I struggle to get the man to understand or to even, not even understand. I'm sure he understands, or not even admit. I'm sure he knows, but just to, just to, just to realize the importance of what we're saying, you know, is a, is a man who doesn't believe that, you know, COVID is as serious as it is doesn't believe that you need to wear a mask, doesn't believe that you should should get the vaccine. And this is a healthcare worker. This is a person who knows. Yeah. So I, I think, you know, it's, it, it, when you ask what to do about it, I think the best you can do is to share the information and um, lead by example, which most of our, our, our healthcare leaders here do. Or, and our, well, most people are in, in positions of power here. Mm -hmm. um, in the U.S. as well, you know, you, you yeah. see the politicians are very visible when they get their vaccines. Just to let people be comfortable that it's not something that we're hiding, that we want the, yeah. the masses, but the, the rich people are not getting it. It's the best you can do. Yeah. It almost sounds as though you all got to it before it became any type of political situation, though. You got people to kind of see what the severity of this was early on without people co-opting the message and saying, oh, you need to be on this side of it, or you're going to be on this side of it. Because I think what we did here, what I remember seeing back in the day was this conversation about, oh, it's a hoax, or it's this or it's that. And there was this denial that was coming um, that, you know, you're going to be okay. But I tell you, when I saw individuals that I know suffering with the actual um, complications of having COVID, it made me a believer. I was like, I don't want that. And I was like, I don't care what it is. I don't want what they have. And so if there are people saying me, to, telling me that there are things that I can do to preserve my health, then I, I was willing to wear the mask and I was willing to get the, the vaccination. 
I remember early on saying, I'm not going to be one of the first people getting the vaccination. But then I changed my tune when, again, I was on a conversation with someone who was suffering and they couldn't breathe and they were coughing and they were in the hospital. And I, I lost it at that point. I was like, wow, I'm sitting here hearing this person possibly dying. Yeah. And, and it, it made me a believer. It made me say, look, <laughs> I am not going to, I'm not, I'm not the one. I don't suffer that way. I don't want to suffer that way. And so I changed my tune quickly about whether or not I believed. I never thought that it wasn't happening, but I mean that I was going to be taking the vaccination. But, but it's, it's, it's unfortunate though that, you know, um, there is so much difficulty in accepting what uh, healthcare and other experts say these days or advice. Yeah. Um, I, I suppose it, 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 <laughs> you might say you, you were fortunate to be, ex, to be able to experience a person uh, suffering the symptoms so that you could realize the seriousness or the, the, the truth in what um, the authorities were telling you. Right. But you know, one thing that we we as you know, especially primary care physicians, one problem we have with convincing people at all about the importance of any uh, disease, really, high blood pressure, diabetes, COVID, is that when people don't see the problem, it's difficult for them to accept that you are really saying, uh, you know, that what you're saying is really valid. You know, yeah. you want to tell somebody that if you have high blood pressure, it's going to harm you. But I'm feeling fine. You know, I've had high blood pressure now for five years. I, I, there's no, I don't have any headaches. I'm feeling right. perfectly fine. You know, this is part of the problem as a, a as a healthcare professional. Oh, you know, okay. We should have to expose you to a person with the actual disease. We should be able to tell you, um, from our expert opinion, this is good for the country. This is good for you, individual. This is good for the, for, for your family. That you need to get, you know, vaccinated. Yeah. Right. Right. That, so how does that it. fit in with, um, so I'm listening to you talk and the, the part of you using the logic of what a doctor would say. Right. And then you have this philosophy of question everything. So tell me about that. How do those two things collide? Right. So, um, that's actually, that, that goes very, very hand in hand, to be honest. Okay. I think if you question, you, you don't just, many people form their opinions based on the opinions of other, you know, of their favorite groups. Mm -hmm. So a person will believe that there is no real COVID because their favorite politician said so, okay. or some YouTube star said so, or they saw a video on YouTube or WhatsApp or something like that, yeah? Yeah. And it, it's interesting that people will pass those, you know, WhatsApp videos around almost as gospel. I've yeah. seen this video, it's true. I'm mm -hmm. not getting the vaccine because this guy who's wearing a white lab coat and has a white beard says that the vaccine is bad for you. And they don't question the source of the information. Right. Um, yeah. At the same time, um, the argument that you will have with, with, with others is, or with those same people is, you know, how can you trust the other authorities that I listen to, like, you know, the CDC, for example, Right. Um, I'd say you, you, you have to have uh, a questioning sort of um, attitude to things. If there is data available, mm -hmm. and the CDC doesn't give you an opinion. They tell you that based on this information that we've collected from the national databases, right. this is the likely best option for protecting your health. Yeah. I'll choose that after questioning Rather than just accepting that, you know, yeah. this video that you sent me is true. Right. Yeah. yeah? So that, that's that's the way I see it. You, you question <laughs> sources of things. and But at some point, when you ask the questions, you have to pick what is the most likely, um, most valid um, conclusion in the end. Do you think that is tied to education level at all? Or is it just um, personal... Um, life experiences? I think it's the latter. Uh, there are so many, but uh, probably um, a balance, I imagine. Okay. Because I, 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 would, I think most of my colleagues, the medical doctors, have gotten the vaccine. 
mm-hmm. a lot of the the healthcare staff are still hesitant about getting the vaccine. Okay. It's, it's not education. Um, they're educated people. Most of them have master's degrees in their fields. Right. You know, but they, they still have this sort of um, vaccine denial or vaccine fear or whatever you want to call it. So I'm not so sure it's purely education. But at the same time, um, I imagine that it probably be, um, actually, I, I can't even say that. I was going to say that um, that persons who are less educated would probably have more doubts, but I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't seen any evidence to suggest Okay. Who the education level of the vaccine and COVID deniers? I, I I don't know. Well, I think that's fair, right? And it goes with what you're saying all along. It's like if you don't have the information, get the information before you make this definitive answer on how you're going to see something or, or how you feel about something. Absolutely. Yeah. There, there is, you know, one of the the arguments I had with my my friend recently is, you know, if you don't um, part of the problem with conspiracy theories is that people tend to start doubting authorities. And by mm-hmm. authorities, I mean expert opinion. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, but, well, you'll find that many people who deny uh, COVID, they start saying, okay, I don't trust what the CDC is saying, and then they will go down a little further. You know, World Health Organization, uh, I'm not so sure about them, and it tends to, it tends to steamroll after that, you know? They don't mm-hmm. trust NASA. They don't trust this. They don't trust that. You know, it, there's a worldwide problem, I think, with um, um, trust in uh, expert opinion mm-hmm. these days. And I think um, leadership has a, a role to play in it. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't want to get into politics, but, you know, um, if, if your leaders are showing... Um, faith and strength and uh, dependence on the, the, the experts that they nominate and they appoint to positions of, of authority. Yeah. And I think that helps to guide people to feel safe, their opinion as well. That hasn't always been the case. Nice, nice. So tell me about doctor's orders. <laughs> doctor's orders. I'm actually... You know, like I said, I'm, I'm a former presenter. I, I don't actually I know, I do saw it. that. Yeah, so when when we went to England, I, I gave it up. Uh, that was four years ago. I gave it up to a colleague of mine. Um, but we did that for a long time, probably about, how long was it? Probably about six years, I believe. Okay. It was a weekly radio program. Um, it was uh, Wednesday mornings, and we would talk about everything. It was a call-in show. We just pick a subject and talked about uh, diabetes and strokes. And you know, if there was a topical um, uh, disease at the time, I imagine we would probably be speaking a lot about COVID nineteen right now. It was an yeah. interesting show. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, I, I like presenting information to people. Okay. Uh, to I like educating people about healthcare, and um, that was a, a very good way to do it. I think it was quite a popular show at the time. So it sounds like you do a little traveling between islands over there. Yesterday you were doing a little bit of traveling. Um, It's part of your job. So what is that like? Um, It must be, first of all, you're living in a beautiful environment and then you get to travel within that environment. So what's that like? Okay, so and just to explain to your viewers, the Cayman Islands are actually a group of three different islands. Uh-huh. It's Grand, Grand Cayman, Cayman Brack, we call it, and Little Cayman. Okay. So yesterday, well, for the weekend, we, we flew off to Little Cayman. You, you don't get Easter weekend off in the U.S., do you? Um, well, they closed some things down, but I, don't, I wouldn't say that we get the, the weekend off. Okay. Well, as a British territory, we were off Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. We got off four days. Oh, wow. Okay. So you're trying to rub it in now. Okay, go ahead. I'm trying my best to rub it in. <laughs> yeah, so we went off to one of these islands just for the weekend. I oh. don't actually travel much for work, actually. I'm, I'm, oh, okay. I, work one, I work in one spot. Oh. Uh, they, yeah. So all three of those islands are, uh, we have the same health service. So, mm-hmm. um, um they are all already well staffed. I don't really have to travel between them. So, what is the the um, 
if you're traveling between the islands in this part of that consortium, you still have to go to customs and all that other stuff in order to, to, to travel? No, 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 not, not customs. No, you still have to show identification. Okay. Um, but you, you don't need a passport, driver's license or two. Okay. Um, but you, you don't go through customs. So the islands are essentially it's one country. It's like driving between, you know, New York and you know, Los Angeles or something. Okay. There's, no, there's no need for um, customs okay. if you go between those. So, well, I'm sorry, yeah. I was thinking, but well, I mean, like when I was talking to you yesterday, you were saying you were going to customs and you couldn't talk to me right then and there. So I was, I was in I was in the the area where they have all those big signs oh. say no no <laughs> no cell phones. No cell phones. I don't know if and I didn't want you arrested or anything. <laughs> I don't know if they relax those provisions when you're just traveling in between islands. I, I didn't want to take the chance. Ah, okay, I <laughs> get you. Confiscate my phone. Yeah. yeah, but not not. We didn't have to get you know you know stamps and all that. You know. Oh, okay, I got you. I got you. So so the Dominican culture is one that I've gotten to know a little bit about. And yeah. one of the pastimes is cricket and. Uh, dominoes and things along those lines and on your on your bio you have that you're this phenomenal dominoes player um what what how how has that become a tradition um on that island uh, so you're talking about dominoes or cricket uh, well both any of those but dominoes for the first yeah so it's it's i don't think it's necessarily this island the entire caribbean uh, okay those those are the the, the basics of Caribbean life, really. Okay. Dominoes and cricket, you know, okay. and um, I don't think there's any Caribbean island. Well, officially, I suppose the, uh, the even even the U.S. Virgin Islands are part considered part of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. And as you know, um, quite a few of my family members um, were there for many years, and so I, I'm familiar with the U.S. system there. And you know, the Caribbean tends to have similar cultures. Okay. Throughout the islands, you know, it's it's a, it's a big area for your listeners. We may not know Caribbean. It's a big, a big span all the way from Trinidad down near South, America. actually Guyana, which is part of South America, mm -hmm. is considered a Caribbean country. Okay. Although it's part of South America, all the way up through uh, to the Bahamas and even Bermuda is considered part of the Caribbean as well. And for some reason, I don't know the history of it or the the, the reasons why. This happens, but cultures tend to be similar in most of those countries. So uh, we tend to like um, cricket. Most people tend to like play dominoes. Um, we tend to have similarities in the rules of the games as well. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we play things, we do things differently from how other regions um, tend to do them. As well. okay. I would always be interested to find out how. I've always questioned how. Maybe you, as a professor of these things, could probably tell me culturally how how these things happen in a in such a wide geographic area, um, especially considering um, that our main link as a territory is the fact that we we're all originally slave countries right. um, under colonial masters. Um, but back then, there was no transportation between countries. There's no aircraft. I'm always curious as to how these cultures still manage to to become similar between similar. the country. You know? Maybe because their roots, are, I mean, they, they still brought their roots with them when they when they went to their different <laughs> when they went to the different islands. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that it's also by virtue of what you have access to, right? So the access to dominoes must have been um, the thing that people were made aware of. Because I think about it in terms of um, I grew up and in the black community, um, spades and bidwist and some other of those card games were huge, right? Oh, that um, in our community. And I think about then there's other communities that were into gin rummy and, and other kinds of card games, poker. And I think that was all cultural in some regards um, within that. So your culture grew up, you know, kind of partaking in that as pastime, and then it, it kind of grows out of that, right? But my, 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 my question is more to do with how, I imagine in the, in the US states, uh -huh. um, it, would be, it would be easier, 
I guess, for culture to be transmitted. Transmitted, yeah. From one area to the other by people moving. You know, you can walk across from one yeah. state to another, you know, and spread your culture with you. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's But still most curious. cultures in America are kind of um, segregated still. Yeah. So I think that's part of it. So it doesn't travel across lines or across cultures because if you're doing that, so I just, again, I, I think about it from my own upbringing, right? So when I was in college, spades was the thing. And, 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 the, and the black students would all get together and that was their thing. They would just play spades left and right. But it was when they got together. So when they were with other cultural groups, they would do other things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be. So you would have someone say, oh, I'm having a spades party tonight. And then everybody would kind of converge on that area and have the spades party. But the other part of it, um, like, but when I'm dealing with other people, then I don't necessarily do a, a spades party. I do some other kind of gathering. I wasn't aware of spades parties. <laughs> That's an interesting. Uh, interesting. I was not aware of spades parties. That's an interesting concept there. I yeah, heard that it was a card game that we we played. That um, I mean, it got very competitive. Just like I see dominoes get very competitive, and That's I and, and and I see dominoes get very loud, right? And, Even violent sometimes, <laughs> and, but but not necessarily violent. But it's it, but you you see people when they play they play with the, such passion. aggressive aggressive then. aggressive passion aggressive, aggressive. <laughs> yes. right. But then they after the game is over they 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 they're, they're like nothing ever happened. You know they're yeah. back to talking about something else. There, there has been violence at times. <laughs> uh oh, I have not I have not witnessed that. Thank goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People can get very. <laughs> I might have been out of my comfort zone. <laughs> can, can I can I ask a question though? If, sure, uh, ask me a question. I, I actually asked this question at home uh, a few weeks ago. Um, uh, it's probably a difficult one. How uh, do you, as a, um, I'm talking about not you, but the black community in the US, um, how do you approach um, uh, healthcare uh, advice that runs counter to culture, strong cultures? For example, the typical food uh, choices for certain communities may not necessarily be the healthiest thing. Right. So um, I was asking, how would you balance that if you were a person, you know, in, in, in a position of, of visibility and you wanted to tell people, you know, listen, the black community is a high risk of heart disease, it's a high risk of diabetes, it's a high risk of stroke, hypertension, all of those things are, are high risk, uh, common, high prevalence in the black community. We need to change our diet. How do you approach that? Because at the same time, if you do that, you are being countercultural because you're telling people don't eat the good foods that you know you grew up eating. How would you, <laughs> as a healthcare professional, yeah. uh, advise people in, in, the, in, in that culture? I can try it, to answer that. That's uh, again, it's a very complex question, and I, you know, I actually was listening to Michelle Obama and give an interview about something very similar a couple of days ago. And um, so the, the concept is this, you go into a community and you try to support them and help them see different things, but people are going to go to what's quick and what's easy. And so when you see fast food or, or something that's, um, that's, that if you're working within a limited budget, when, when you see something that's a dollar versus going to a store and, and getting fruit or vegetables and, or having to cook or do something along those lines, when you think about what's happening in that environment during that time, you're going to opt for the thing that's within your budget. And, and so in a lot of times that may not translate into healthier foods, right? And so you're, 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 so you're thinking economically, I have to pay for my rent or my, home, my house and my, my mortgage. I got to pay for my car, my transportation. I got to pay for my kids. I have to buy for clothes. And so when they look at how they are budgeting their money, they make choices 
based on that. They even make choices about their health care, and you kind of alluded to that too, uh, you know, how are they taking care of their health? Well, if you know that to go to the, I've seen people, I have people in my own family who have done this, where, you know, they, they won't take an ambulance to the hospital because they're like, how am I going to pay for that? What, what, what am I going to do in order to do that? So they sometimes don't make the decision. And I, can, I can't say they, there are individuals, I believe, who don't make the, the conscious decision to do things because they think that the impact of doing it is going to be worse than them going through and doing it. So they'll sacrifice in some of the cases their health care or the food choices so that there's abundance or there's help in terms of how they see it, right? And so um, these fast food restaurants and other places who have made these dollar meals and all these other things have been attractive and, and the, they don't have the health care or concern for the people. They just want to increase their bottom line. Just make money. And so again, so it's like, it's a perpetual thing, right? It just continues to happen because I guess in my eyes, you're going to go for what's going to help you move forward. And if you don't know that this is something that is, is detrimental to your health care or to the health care of your, your kids and things along those lines, you're going to continue to do that. And then when somebody comes in as an authority figure and tell you that what you're doing is wrong, well, what's the first thing that most people do when somebody tells them that they're doing something wrong? They're going to bite back, right? They're going to be like, well, hold up. How, who do you think you are? And then the issue is distracted from really what the issue is. And then it's about, you know, you having this conflict with someone because they, you think that they're telling you what to do. That, that's exactly the problem. And then it becomes a cultural discussion then rather than a healthcare discussion. Right? Yeah. So my, 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 my struggle is always to find out how do you, because you can't just give up and say, you know, it's, 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 it can't be done. There still needs to be some approach. Um, but it's meeting or, people, like as a counselor, I know that I have to meet people where they are. Mm-hmm. I have to go in and I have to cultivate a relationship with them. I have to build a relationship with them. And when I build that relationship, then perhaps they'll listen, right? They'll be able to hear me differently. But if I go in with, okay, I know better than you and you just need to listen to me, well, you're, you're going to get opposition. You're gonna, people are not going to want to hear that because then they're going to be like, oh, you think I'm wrong or you think I'm a bad person? And it becomes something that you didn't even go there intending to do. But it, when, it be, when it gets there, you know, it's a lost cause. Yeah, that, my, my, I, I'm... I'm... I was, I was mostly concerned that I don't, you know, although I'm in the Caribbean, I should explain to your, 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 your listeners, your, your yeah. viewers, that um, we are mostly under the shadow of American media in our regions. <laughs> you know, from, from birth, we watch American TV and that's all we got. We don't, you know, small economies, we don't have the, 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 the money to have our own television stations and production. Right. So we don't watch any reality shows there. <laughs> The whole lot. The whole lot. So, <laughs> my, 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 my query is always, you know, I don't see um, enough, you know, as a profession, as a medical professional, I don't know if I see enough focus on uh, those issues, the, the, the things in the cultural, when it comes to healthcare, the cultural issues that may affect your health. There, and there I is. also think that, you know, there's a society, there's, I think there's a there's an institutionalized system that's in place that helps yeah. to secure that. Absolutely. Yeah. But it's the, it's the approach that I'm talking about. I, I'm, I, I'm, I still want it. It's just one of the things that I wonder about. I suppose that's, a great, that's going to be a long discussion. I don't think we have time for it. So we'll have to have you back and we'll just discuss that. Oh dear, I'm in trouble. Or maybe okay. we bring a whole bunch of different people on. There you go. And so we'll just have an ongoing discussion that about discussion. that. Well, I have yeah. questions. I'd love to have that discussion. I, I have questions about those things. All right. Well, we'll have to work that out. That sounds like a good plan to me. That sounds good. All right. So listen, thank you for um, taking the time out of your day and being a part of the podcast today. I really appreciate having the opportunity to talk with you, um, especially with it being World Health Day and you being... Um, one of the people I know close to me enough to be able to call on a doctor. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. <laughs> and um, you're welcome. And if, I, you're welcome. 
anytime. I appreciate you so much. I hope that you are in, will go out now and enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, okay. Tell folks Anyone? down there, I said hello. And um, next week on Friday, this week on Friday at one o'clock though, um, maybe you want to tune in. Um, I'm having some board members um, from Pre-Med American Medical Student Association. They're going to be my guests. So maybe I'll ask them a couple of those questions you just asked me. I'll ask them specifically, how come it's hard to get to healthcare in, in, in certain communities? Is this this Friday, you mean, yeah? This Friday, one. It'll be 12 o'clock your time. Um, I'll, be, I'll be texting you messages while you talk. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. You, <laughs> you, might, you might want to put it on, the, on, on YouTube and... Um, and then have uh, so I'll be able to see him better there. I, I try to stay oh. away from my phone when I'm when I'm when I'm in the middle of this. But if I know you're going to do that, I'll, I'll I'll pay more attention to it. Or right, I'll get somebody to slip you a note in the middle of your talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you again. We'll talk soon. Um, I really appreciate you taking the time out and sharing your wisdom. Thank you for inviting me. It's been no worry. Take care. All right. Again, folks, check us out on, on Friday when we have um, AMS, AMSA students uh, who are going to be coming to talk to us. They're going to be pre-med students, I believe, who are going to talk to us. They're board members on this society. And so I'm excited to have that happen. And so thank you for joining us today. And this time we're, we're just going to say sayonara to you all. And we'll see you next time.